Hello and welcome to all of our gold viewers who are here with us today. I'm Kristen Schwarz, licensed midwife and MC here at Gold, and I'm chatting today with Megan McMillan about her upcoming presentation for the Gold Lactation Online Conference of 2023. Welcome, Megan. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's good to have you back here at Gold. It's been a little while since you came here last, right? <laughs> um, yeah, it's been a couple of years, I think. I was like uh, right at the height of the pandemic, I believe, last uh, when you were with us. It was. So it's, <laughs> it's wonderful to have you back here uh, for another presentation at Gold. So for our viewers who have not been here, they are last time around when you are presenting at Gold. Tell us, first of all, where in the world are you located? So I live in Chicago, Illinois, in the United States. I'm actually in a suburb of Chicago. So I'm about halfway between Chicago, Illinois and Milwaukee, Wisconsin, if you're familiar <laughs> with that area, but I'm in, I'm in the States. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you for sharing that as well. So let's also talk now about your professional background. You have you have quite a beautiful range there. You're, of course, an IBCLC, uh, but you're, you started off in, and why don't I let you explain this? <laughs> sure. Absolutely. So I'm actually, this is actually a second career for me. Um, I originally was in the hospitality industry. Oh, I worked as a, um, mm -hmm, as a hotel and restaurant manager for several years before I decided that was not the career for me. Um, it was not the, the the path I was meant to be on. And I went back to school and I got a master's degree in human nutrition. And then I sat for an exam to become a registered dietitian. Um, so I've been a registered dietitian for 10 years. And during that time, I also um, did some advanced training and got more experience in uh, maternal and child health. I worked in the NICU for five years. Um, and it was during the time in the NICU that I um, earned my hours to sit for the IBCLC exam. So I took the IBCLC exam in 2019 and passed. So. Wonderful. Well, thanks for sharing that. So yeah, you have a really um, uh, a, a wide range of education there for nutrition and lactation, and it goes together, right? I mean, like, <laughs> nutritionally, of course, you know, um, breast or human milk is what the baby gets or the infant gets. It's the first uh, nutrition there. <laughs> so how important is that? And um, it's really wonderful that you shared that to you, that you were working in the NICU and um, then that brought you to, uh, you know, become an IBCLC. So thank you for sharing that there. Now, yes. your topic here at Gold is how breastfeeding and food allergies intersect, what we know and what um, and how we can help. That's a big topic, right? That's, a, I mean, that's a huge topic here. Um, and, and you will pack a lot into that one hour. I know because we've uh, talked about it. We had our training. We saw the presentation, you know, the, the uh, PowerPoint and such. So it's going to be fantastic. Um, let me ask you this. Do you think, or is this just maybe my perception, that um, the development of food allergies in infants, is that something that is increasing? Or do we just have more awareness of, uh, you know, it in the last, during the last few years? I think it's actually both. I do think mm -hmm. it's both. And I think the interesting thing that well, I don't know if it's the interesting thing, but one of the things that people, most people don't know, and this is one of the topics I cover in the presentation, is there's, there's actually two different types of food allergies. And so we have to be very careful when we're talking about food allergies in breastfed babies, because it's, it's a, it's, it's a type that's not well known and well understood. Um, so these are, these are true food allergies, but they elicit a different type of response from the immune system. And so I think when we're talking about um, you know, prevalence or incidence of those types of food allergies that we're seeing in exclusively breastfed babies, I do think the rates are higher than what is being reported or, or you know, what is um, common knowledge. Um, because typically what we think of is this other type of food allergies, like traditional food allergies, when you think mm -hmm. of, you know, a young school-aged child who's allergic to peanuts Peanut, and they yes. need an epinephrine pen and that sort of a thing. Um, those are, you know, true classic food allergies. And most of the information that's out there, most of the research studies, most of the education and awareness is surrounding those types of food allergies. And so I think as 
more education comes out, more research comes out on the other type, which they're called non-IgE mediated food allergies. These are the types of things we're seeing with breastfed babies where we see things like blood in the stool. Um, mm -hmm. These are not as well understood. They're not as well researched. And so I think there's going to be a lot more information to come about those types of allergies over the next decade or so. So we're kind of here at the forefront <laughs> mm -hmm. to, to see, you know, and, and there will be more research uh, to be done. And so that probably leads uh, also to the assumption that there is um, there are a lot of undiagnosed infants at the moment because it's not something that we, you know, uh, we have all the research for or, or what have you seen that as well? I, you know, it's really interesting. I see both. I see okay. under like underdiagnosed or misdiagnosis. And then I also see in my professional opinion, what I would consider um, a false diagnosis too. Um, it is interesting. I, I feel like we see two extremes on the spectrum and there's not a lot of middle ground happening. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I have a lot of clients who come to me that were told, you know, we think your baby has a milk protein allergy, so stop eating dairy. And when we really get into it, it turns out this baby, you know, has an oral restriction and that's what was causing them to be gassy and things like that. And this mom never needed to cut out dairy from her diet. Um, yes. But yeah. but I also see the opposite where it, it where it is, you know, there's very obvious signs such as blood in the stool and they're told to just... Yeah, just wait it out. It'll be fine. You know, oh, this is normal. So, oh. so we see, <laughs> yeah. I see both ends. I do think it probably is underdiagnosed, um, but I also have seen the opposite as well. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so, and that this is of course something you will talk about in the presentation. But what I'm of course curious to know is what can we do? You know, uh, so so what are some things that we could do? I think the biggest thing as lactation consultants is to make sure that we are ruling out other potential causes of the, you know, the symptoms or the behaviors that are concerning. Um, again, addressing things like oral restrictions, um, oversupply, a strong forceful letdown, a lot of those types of, um, you know, lactation issues or even just feeding issues in general, as well as like, you know, paste bottle feeding. All of those things can cause, you know, gas, spit up, uh, you know, explosive mm -hmm. poops, green poops, frothy poops, things that a lot of times parents are concerned about. Um, and that might potentially lead them to think there is something in their diet that is causing these issues when, when really a lot of times we can just fix them with addressing the, the, uh, the feeding issues, whether it's uh, feeding at the breast or feeding with a bottle. Um, so that's one thing that we can do. I think really it's important for us to rule out any other potential causes before we head down the path of, you know, dietary changes. Mm -hmm. The Animation, other thing yes. I think, Go yeah, ahead. exactly. Yes. I think the other thing that it's really important too for, for all of us is to understand our scope and understand our skills and to definitely refer out or collaborate with other practitioners when, when necessary. And, mm -hmm. um, I do that all the time because I, you know, I am not an IBCLC that is super well trained in oral restrictions. Honestly, right. that is not my strong suit. And so if I'm having kind of an inkling that that's what's going on here with this baby, I will refer them out to another IBCLC to have that looked at first. And then potentially if that, if that IBCLC who is, you know, uh, very knowledgeable in oral restrictions or oral mode of function and ties says, I don't think it's what's happening here, they might come back to me and then we can talk about, um, you know, potentially making changes to diets and seeing if this truly is something that maybe is an allergy or a food sensitivity. Um, so I think those are the two biggest things that mm -hmm. we as a profession can do. I, I absolutely love that, that you said, collaborate with other care providers, because we, we often think we have to do it all, we have to know it all. And if we don't have the answer, if we can't figure it out by ourselves, then we are a failure as in our profession, which is not true at all. We can't be a master in all things, right? I mean, as you mentioned, you, you, you're, you're an expert in nutrition, but maybe you're not the expert in tongue tie or oral restrictions and things like that. Right. And, and, you know, and that is true for, for many professionals. So I think 
um, working together with other care providers is really, really essential or building up a good network or, you know, so we can refer out uh, without uh, worrying. And because it is dangerous to do something that is not really um, in our scope of practice, you know, when Absolutely. we're thinking, oh, maybe that's it. And let's let's go in that direction. We may cause more harm than good um, when we are not really um, when that's not really in our scope of practice. I absolutely love that uh, that you said that. And um, I also liked how you said ruling out everything else first, you know, and yes. that requires really detective work. <laughs> and yes, that's something that you, you shared before your love for detective and stories and <laughs> TV shows. We talked a lot about that. Mm -hmm. So that must be right up your alley then really looking and dissecting into, okay, what's really going on here, you know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We, you know, we don't want to lead families down a path that isn't healthy for them or isn't going to give them, you know, the, the results that they're looking for. And we also don't want to waste their time and their money either. So right. I, you mm -hmm. know, I, I definitely want to make sure that we really have a good sense of what the problem is. And we try to figure out what is, what makes the most sense in, in, in terms of solutions. Absolutely. I am so looking forward to your presentation here, Megan. I can't wait. Um, but before I let you go, any last words here from you for our audience? Um, I, well, first of all, I'm just really excited to do the presentation. It's a topic that is near and dear to me. I love talking about it. My children both have food allergies. So this is this is a topic that is definitely personal as well. Um, and I think, again, just key takeaway is um, well, one of the things is really understanding that the families that are experiencing this, they're, they're under a lot of stress. Mm, Most of yeah. our families are that are having breastfeeding, uh, you know, issues or, or concerns. It's a stressful time. And I think that they need a lot of, um, validation and a lot of credit for seeking help. So that would be one of my key takeaways is just to make sure that they're getting the appropriate attention that they need. Well, thank you so much, Megan. It was a pleasure sitting down here with you chatting and I'm very much looking forward to the presentation coming up. Thank you, Kristen. And now some information for our audience here. The presentation, how breastfeeding and food and allergies intersect, what we know and uh, what we can, how we can help by Megan McMillan is going to be live on April 18th. But don't worry, if you can't be there in person, live, everything is, of course, recorded. This is, of course, part of the Gold Lactation Online Conference 2023. Make sure you check it out. We have a keynote that is open access coming up on April 3rd. We have a fantastic fantastic program planned with networking session, interactive workshops, and so much more. So I invite you to go to goldlactation.com for more information. And I hope to see everyone at the conference. Bye-bye, everyone.